Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Joyce Markham. Uh, I'm a student here at Kellogg College. I'm on the second year of doing a master's course in literature and arts. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you here present at Kellogg this evening and to everyone joining us uh, online uh, for what I hope will be a very uh, entertaining uh, discussion. And I'll explain in a moment why it's going to be very entertaining for everyone sitting this side of the camera. Um, the college has been running some sort of event to celebrate International Women's Day since 2014. When this particular event was planned, I actually imagined that I'd be welcoming everyone to a brave new world uh, where science had helped us out of the pandemic. And here in the UK, we'd be do doing everything we could to establish a brave new world uh, where the arts was becoming part of the new normal. But instead, of course, I find myself thinking about events in Eastern Europe. And I'm particularly thinking this evening about the very brave women in Ukraine who are dealing with the most terrible hardships and also those brave women in Russia who are uh, protesting against the war. And of course, I also have to think about women across the world who may be in war zones or suffering, suffering in famine areas and have to think that we're very lucky to be sitting here this evening, uh, been able to discuss uh, the arts. Because difficult as times are, I have to say, I firmly believe the arts are a fundamental part of the glue that binds us all together as a human race. It gives us things to talk about in common. It gives us things to discuss that are different in different cultures from which we can learn a lot. Now, at this stage, I was going to say, I'm going to introduce the panel. But the excitement from our side is that one member of the panel is stuck on a train somewhere just outside London and may or may not make it today. And I'm, I feel really disappointed if Patrice can't make it because I'm sure Patrice Lawrence is familiar to many of you as a Caribbean writer, uh, a British writer of Caribbean heritage. Uh, she's award-winning writer, many books aimed at young adults, and I hope she'll be able to make it uh, later this evening. Also with us is Caroline Douglas, who is the director of the Contemporary Arts Society. She was formerly head of the Arts Council collection, where she was responsible for major acquisitions, uh, including Grayson's Paris suite of tapestries, The Vanity of Small Differences, and Roger Heron's Art Angel Commission seizure, which is now in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Uh, Caroline has also organized very important exhibitions with artists such as Bridget Riley, Anish Kapoor, and Gary Hume. Since joining the Contemporary Art Society, Caroline has championed the work of women artists and initiated programs to support UK museums in addressing decolonization diversity and representation within their collections. Also with us is Oxford's own Becca Valens, who is the Deputy Director of Arts at the Old Fire Station, a major arts centre for creativity in the heart of Oxford, which encourages people from all backgrounds to come and understand the shape of the world that we live in through stories, creativity and the arts. Uh, Becca has worked at the fire station since 2011 and has seen it grow from a small team of three people to now employing over 30 people. Before that, Becca has been involved with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, the Almeida Theatre, the Barbican Centre, the National Trust and English Heritage. Now, I hate to say bringing up the rear, but in the event that Patrice doesn't uh, make it. Uh, we have with us our organiser for the evening, Judith Holder. Uh, Judith uh, is a well-known producer and writer and is currently working with Jenny Eclair on the Older and Wider podcast. 
Now, to use Judith's own words, she would describe herself as a mad old girl with an eye for the upsides of aging and an addiction to wild swimming and lockable Tupperware, perhaps more of which <laughs> later. So can I invite you, Carolyn, to start off this evening's proceedings? Thank you very much indeed. And it's, um, it's really lovely to be here and to celebrate International Women's Day with, with all of you. Um, I am the director of the Contemporary Art Society, and um, that is a charity. We're based in London, and we were founded over 100 years ago in 1910. And we still do the thing today that we were founded for 110 years ago, which is um, that we raise money through private means and we buy work by living artists, which we donate to museums across the UK. And we're currently working with 74 different museums from as far north as Orkney to as far south as Plymouth and east to west as well. Um, I think I'm going to get my slideshow here. There we go. Right. So I was, um, I was asked to talk about uh, the pandemic from, from our perspective. Um, and I'm starting with this slide, which is a screen grab from a Zoom thing that we did online um, in April um, 2020. So very, very soon after the beginning of the first lockdown, I would say that I was within a month of having heard the word Zoom in this context for the very first time. But like so many organizations, we instantly uh, jumped online with all of our content. There felt like there was a huge imperative to keep in contact with people. We, um, we are very fortunate in that we're an organization with a business model that means we can work from home very easily. Um, and we very quickly became aware of quite how privileged we were um, in that respect. <clears throat> our, our work generally connects us with museum curators, with living artists, with commercial galleries, with writers. The Contemporary Art Society sits in the middle of this great network of um, the visual arts community in the UK and internationally. So one of the first things that we did was just to hit the phone and just keep talking to all of our, our closest contacts and just see how they were doing. And this was an event where um, I talked to three different artists. Um, and I suppose it came out of my desire to make apparent or to make public, because we did this as a Zoom event for, for uh, our followers. So there were a hundred people online watching this. Um, I wanted them to follow my, I suppose, pathway through understanding what was going on because one could quite easily have rather a romantic view or one could have at that stage that, well, being locked down, if you're in your studio, it's fine really, isn't it? It's what artists do. It's, you know, that romantic idea. Um, and it couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, and what came out of this conversation um, was this description of artists and contemporary artists in particular, I think, have an expanded practice, which means that they're intensely collaborative. Um, and so the, the lockdown, the shutting of the museums, the galleries, meant that concentric layers of activity shut down for layers and layers of different people associated and working within the visual arts. Um, and it shut down all means of income for all of them overnight. It was terrifying. There were no more exhibitions. There were no more sales in the galleries that were closed. Uh, there were no more fees for appearances. There were no more fees for commissions or installations or doing talks. Um, and that meant that not only was the artist not getting any income, but they couldn't pay their studio assistants or the fabricators or the freelance technicians or the shippers and on and on, the whole thing sort of tiles down as this sort of unfolding picture of um, a real horror story. And it felt terribly important for people to understand the, the degree of peril that um, was unfolding for thousands of people across the UK. Um, I'm, I'm speaking only for the visual arts because that's my world. And I know that um, for, for very many other art forms, it was a very similar story. Um, 
our response as an organization was to launch a new fundraising initiative, a crowdfunding campaign. We thought, okay, well, let's just try and get more money to artists. Let's buy more art. Let's do more than ever. And we started a crowdfunding campaign just after this, actually, with the um, intention or the hope, the ambition of raising about £20,000. And we ended up raising £230,000 in under a month. Uh, such was the desire of the general public to do something to help. It was very, it was humbling and extraordinary that as soon as people found a platform that they trusted, who would deliver their money to the right place, then and we had this extraordinary support. Um, there, there are there are artists. This is one of the works that we bought through through that. Um, through the funds raised through that crowdfunding campaign, um, showing the, the place that it went to. Um, and there are artists who do have a studio practice and for whom actually things could be um, quite stable. I mean, if you can afford to keep paying the rent or you're lucky enough to own your studio. As with every sphere of society, the pandemic laid bare the, the architecture of people's finances, I think. Uh, their economic circumstances. Um, but many artists who might have had a more expansive practice previously had to batten down on the very simplest of means. Um, Claudette Johnson is a um, very, very highly regarded figurative painter, but generally works from models. In lockdown, she was her only model. Um, and so she produced a series of these incredibly powerful self-portraits that um, speak deeply to us all, I think, about the period of introspection, of being thrown back on your own resources, um, and that, that tough, defiant look she has is incredibly moving. Um, this is um, by Gillian Waring. Again, this is an artist who's, more, who's better known for making films, uh, large scale photographs, working with models, working with technicians who produce prostheses, etc. Um, she works a lot with the idea of masking. Here again, she was thrown back literally just onto her, her own herself as her resource. And she produced a whole series of these very contemplative, um, somber self portraits that I think a lot of people connected to because issues around mental health became so, so much to the fore through the pandemic, through, through this experience of isolation and precariousness. And what we found um, immediately was that our museum members across the whole country were very anxious to be acquiring work immediately, which expressed the pandemic to inflect their collections with works that would, that would describe in some way the human experience as it was happening. Um, so there was a great appetite for acquiring works of this nature. Um, I, think, I think one of the sort of overriding experiences for me over the last two years is the way that the voices of young people have just become so much more important. It's felt um, so much more, they feel so much more relevant. And there seems to have been an, 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 a change in the hierarchy of uh, the, the, the volume of these voices. And a lot of that has been around um, issues of representation. Um, and I think the pandemic really accelerated existing conversations that have been happening for some years at museums around questions of representation. But um, people missed their museums terribly. We heard this again and again and again through all of our networks. And it threw, um, threw a, a sort of spotlight on the role of the museum in society as a kind of secular temple its civic role, its convening role, a space for thinking, a space for testing out ideas, um, but also as, as um, civic institutions which have a responsibility to represent their community. And so this brought us back to issues of representation. This is um, work by um, a young artist um, 
non-binary artist called Roseanne Robertson, um, who makes work that, uh, in her their words, focuses on um, queering the landscape. So it's this practice that looks at the, the interconnectivity of landscape and sexuality. Incredibly interesting. This is from a body of work that she they made while um, artist in residence in St. Ives. Um, and uh, although they're, they're a Yorkshire born artist, so this has gone into a collection in Wakefield. And then finally, I suppose the thing um, that I really wanted to say as well is that um, no description of our experience of the last two years could possibly really, for us, for us as an organization, untangle uh, the pandemic from the experience of the Black Lives <coughs> Matter protests of the summer of 2020. Again, this was a massively galvanizing experience uh, in, in our sector. Um, and something, again, museums have been working into this area for quite some time, um, but really uh, accelerated the desire to um, improve or address representation within permanent collections and museums. We, we run an annual survey of all of our museum members um, and in the most recent one we asked whether um, the Black Lives Matter protests had had any effect on collecting policy and more than 80 percent of the respondents to the survey said yes that it had uh, which is an, an extraordinary percentage I think. Um, Sonia Boyce uh, is representing Britain in Venice this summer at the Venice Biennale um, and she's a really major figure in the Black British art movement. And we bought this large scale installation for the Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, um, which is the summation of uh, two and a half decades worth of work for her. It's been a, an ongoing continuous project, but this is the, the largest and final iteration of the project, which is um, called Devotional Wallpaper. Um, and it features uh, black British female singers. Um, so it's sort of looking across different genres, but I'm sort of bringing this in just because uh, it's sort of emblematic of what we're doing to support museums to be thinking very, very hard and deeply about the way that they decolonize and address, address the question of how, how as an institution they speak to their audiences as they come back in. Wonderful, thank you very much, Caroline. Can I just explain that I'm not bored. I'm, I'm just trying to, um, the people commenting and and, uh, and so on who are online, that's what I'm doing. Thank you, Judith. Uh, if we may, we'll, we'll take questions uh, when everyone's had a chance to say a few words. So Becca, if I can invite you now, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, okay. Uh, this is the old fire station in, on George Street in Oxford, and it's a big, lively building. It has a theatre, a studio, an exhibition space, and a cafe. And that's where I work, and I've worked for the last 12 years. Now, this lively and vibrant space shares two organisations. Arts at the Old Fire Station, interested in supporting artists in developing their careers and engaging with new community groups and it supports crisis as well, um, engaging homeless and vulnerably housed people in training or did education and training opportunities. It's now very focused on housing. Um, and we share this building and we spend a lot of time thinking and working how to include people. And then back in March, 2020, that building shut down and there was nothing. And all the rough sleepers and the people on our doorsteps, they went into a hotel. All the artists stayed at home and the building became a food hub uh, temporarily for Oxford City Council. What do you do when your identity is wrapped up in a building? So this was a big issue for us because our, our entire raison d'etre was about bringing people in welcoming the community, welcoming artists, supporting people to change their label within our building. We worked very hard with our crisis to 
engage uh, crisis members and ex-members in everything we do, from performing, volunteering, to being on our board. So there's a big engagement process that was happening at the heart of that building, plus a lot of work commissioning artists. Um, and it all ended. Um, and uh, at the same time, as we experienced this loss of identity, we moved from a, a 30 members of staff, we furloughed everyone except six people. So then we realized that we needed to really reconnect. So what happened was uh, we did learn about Zoom very quickly. We did all that education. <coughs> Uh, we worked hard to keep staff connected, including furloughed staff with drop-in coffee mornings uh, on Zoom, the works. But we were very conscious that we also had, an, A, we wanted to get away from Zoom, and also we had a lot of people who didn't have the access to technology and to uh, um, access to technology in order to engage with the things we could offer on Zoom. So we developed a very simple project called Postcards from a Pandemic, uh, anybody, an invitation to the whole of Oxford, anybody can join in, we'll send you a postcard, we'll send you some drawing materials and draw or describe what you can see from your window. We thought 20 people. <laughs> uh, it became an administrative interesting operation because loads of people signed up um, and they were a combination of, uh, of artists, you know, who are labelled artists, homeless people who are labelled homeless, members of uh, dancers who are labeled dancers, all the kinds of people all kind of took a postcard, wrote on it, drew on it, and then we swapped them over and we moved the postcard on. And then people started responding to each postcard. And so we started to have a dialogue across Oxford and actually beyond um, between people. And we called everybody an artist, everybody. It was an artistic process. It was an artistic dialogue. And we started an artistic dialogue going. And in the meantime, on Zoom, we had a staff Christmas party where we all made Christmas wreaths together with the help of an artistic intervention. So we're trying to keep those connections going. Okay. The other thing that happened was um, we uh, worked very closely with Oxford Hub, who I don't know if any of you know, they're a fantastic organization that pulled together from the heart of um, the students of um, Oxford created the Student Oxford Hub. That's now become a much wider volunteer organisation. They had 50 odd people at the beginning of the pandemic. By the end of the pandemic, they had over 200 volunteers, uh, more than. And the, um, what happened was they spent a lot of time recruiting volunteers and identifying people who needed support across Oxford. What has this got to do with an arts organisation? I hear you asking. Um, so what we did was we were already developing a methodology of understanding the process of change that happens when people experience the arts. So we, and it's called the storytelling methodology, and it's all about what is the most significant change for you. And we took that methodology and we took it to the work that Oxford Hub was doing with volunteers, people who were stuck in their homes, people who needed prescriptions, people who needed letters for their tortoise. Believe me, that was a challenge. And we took those connecting to connections and those people and we told their story. We asked them to tell their story and we pulled those stories together into a lovely booklet, I recommend you read it, um, called uh, Oxford Together. And then we took those stories and we invited, and at this point we realized we had a, we had a lot of money we were like, why have we got all this money? We're closed, we're, we have a commercial operation, we're not getting any money in. Partly it was because our funders were fantastic. They just picked up the phone at the beginning, a bit like the general public and said, what do you need? How can we keep you going? But then the other thing that happened was, um, we realized that we had a pot of money and we're like, oh, what was that for? And it was for commissioning artists, for commissioning theater shows, for commissioning exhibitions, for uh, commissioning people to create things. And we stopped doing that. And so we were like, what can we do with this money? How do we get it out into the pockets of the people who really need it? So we commissioned artists to do artistic interpretations of the stories. And we, um, and it was everything, audio, sculpture, you, know, you name it, people did it. Um, and we also did a call out to Oxford, to the artists of Oxford. And we said, make something. This is an open wide commission. It can be any art form. We'll give you 500 pounds. 
pay local 500 pounds to make something and we will do something with that thing that you make. Um, and so we had, again, we had, uh, we had everything from, um, uh, oh gosh, we had, yeah, audio art, visual art, um, with somebody, the idea of connection and how can we connect safely and talk to each other safely, that became a big thing and hence the giant telephones. Um, and we even had somebody develop to play for Zoom. So we did lots of things and it's all about connecting, trying to keep those connections going really. Um, and while we uh, did a lot of work to support artists, other artists supported us. So um, we had already got a relationship with the playwright Mike Bartlett, who, you know, Dr. Foster, lots of things. And uh, he, uh, one of the first things that happened was we started, we had a theatre and we um, didn't know how to make plays on Zoom. Now we all know how to make a play on Zoom, but at that time we didn't know anything about it. And so we got some cameras together, um, we got some staff and uh, some artists very kindly came and gave their time so that we could practice and work out what we were doing. And one of those artists was Mike Bartlett and he brought a small play that we, we did as part of a Christmas show on Zoom. And he very handily knew an editor from The Crown who uh, came and uh, explained, showed us how to do editing as well. So we could show shows not, not live because we're not the national theatres, we quickly discovered, but that, so we could do nice edited versions that could be shown to audiences. The great thing about this was, my goodness, we had audiences in America, Germany. We were on the international map and we're a small organisation in the heart of Oxford. So that was, one. and then bless him, this, and then, Mr. Salgado came out of, um, yeah, so, um, so back in the building, the, the world started to open up and we started to bring our staff back tentatively together, hesitantly. Um, and we felt we'd been all really changed by what, by what we'd gone through and all the things said about Black Lives Matters, all the things about relationships, about inequality had been very stark for us. And we were back in a building, what was it, 18 months later? And the program was exactly the same because all those shows that had wanted to be, we programmed before the pandemic, I were queuing up and waiting and very keen, obviously, to come back. And so our program looked as if nothing had happened. So that was an interesting moment. And uh, we were like, what's going on here? But actually gradually, well, first of all, that whole first tranche of programming didn't happen because we had Omicron, um, but we also um, did start to, um, uh, we did things slept, slipped in, started coming coming together. And one of those things was Mrs. Delgado. So Mike Bartlett, who, who swore he never had a Christmas play it left in him, said, I can give you another Christmas play, which was great. Um, and he wrote Mrs. Delgado, which is absolutely about, what happens to relationships in a pandemic and how those relationships change and what does community mean and I really recommend you Thank you can you. catch it online it's going to go on tour again to London um, you missed it at the Playhouse uh, a couple of weeks ago um, I really recommend it but and then we started to find that that shows started coming in comedians started sticking Covid references into the material the previous material that they would now brought this time and, and our program slowly changed. And one of the big things was a project we'd started before the pandemic. And this is part of our opening up. It was a really big part of opening up for us, which is we did a partnership project with Crisis, which we do often, like once every, well, it was once every two years, so it was once every four years, um, where we took the premise of what would Oxford look like after a flood? And we uh, worked with them and um, with uh, crisis members, community theatre people, and we created the we created a creative collective. And together, they worked with professionals um, to create a show about what would Oxford look like after a flood. And we started having the conversation because, of course, the climate crisis didn't go away either. And that's been a very powerful, as well as the Black Lives Matter. The, the concern for the climate crisis has been quite a powerful motivator for us coming, getting back into the world. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there. I think I've talked enough. I'm, I, there's 
there's lots you could go in all kinds of ways and I really would like to respond to some things you said yeah. I, I thought there's there's a really interesting thing about what isolation does to people what isolation does to your staff how you look after people post pandemic not just during a pandemic but I'll leave it there sorry okay thank you very much Becca right Judith I think we're all agog to hear about lockable Tupperware <laughs> I don't know whether I can say much about that but um, and by the way, I did catch at the Oxford Playhouse, uh, Mr Delgado, and it was fabulous. Um, I mean, I think what strikes me is that uh, the arts industry, which is why I, I suppose I thought we should talk about the arts on, on International Women's Day. I mean, the arts is an enormous industry, isn't it, in this country? I mean, I think I, I read somewhere that it's actually, it, it creates, it, it contributes more to um, GDP than the car industry, which is actually maybe this, these days not that much. But in any case, it's a huge industry, isn't it? And yet during COVID, we were generally the freelancers, the people without contracts, or between contracts. Um, and even if we weren't actually taking direct commissions, as you say, Caroline, we were the people, the technicians serving those people. And um, certainly in terms of comedy and uh, the performing arts, massive loss of income, huge loss of income and, 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 and little support from the government. And yet at the, t at the time, I don't know how you all felt, but I craved um, a sort of an artistic response to what we were all going through. And certainly it's very interesting online, people here commenting how much they all wanted um, a perspective on this big common experience. I mean, that was unique, wasn't it? A big global experience. And we all wanted that connection and perspective and maybe a way of processing it as well. Um, and, I, and I don't know about you, but I kind of, I lapped up anything that was um, sort of about the emotions of what we were going through. And, and, and daily on Radio 4, the, at the end of PM, for instance, there were people's lockdown diaries where people would talk about the way the way that that people would say goodbye on their mobile phones and just just the the intensity of what people were going through on such a massive scale um and and, and one really memorable oh gosh that's my phone oh i'm so sorry and it's on just, do not disturb i thought oh my goodness that's my daughter who's just given birth to twins um, i had to turn her off oh god she literally has a couple of days ago. Um, yes, I remember also a documentary about um, some ICU nurses in Birmingham who at the end of every shift, um, they, they, they put a disco uh, ball up in their staff room and they used to play disco music at the end of each shift just to sort of let, oh, you know, the tension out and lighten up a bit and sort of process it. And I think all of those things, we all, and Grace and Perry's art show, so, I kind of lapped up and wanted more and more, and I still crave the definitive piece of fiction, which presumably is, is in the pipeline, I hope. But, I mean, there have been bits and pieces, but, and I suppose it's difficult as a writer, isn't it? Because we are still, you don't know how it's going to end. You don't quite know how it's going to end because we're still in the middle of it. And therefore it is quite hard to, um, to process artistically into a, a piece of fiction. Um, Patrice, who sadly, I don't think she will make it, and it's such a shame she left home at 12, 12 o'clock to get here from Hastings, but she was saying to us, wasn't she, that, that she couldn't read fiction during lockdown, I suppose because it was fiction and it didn't relate to what we were going through, and I kind of get that, and I think she's written a lot of non-fiction um, during lockdown, but I, I, do, I do think it would be worth us talking about, wouldn't it? what it is that art does for us and what we craved. I mean, you talked about secular temples, uh, um, galleries becoming that, and I so get that. The first time I went back to a, 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 um, a gallery, I was really struck what a contemplative and important experience it is that we took for granted. Um, I mean, what, 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 do you, what I, Joyce, you're chairing this, not me, but it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? What it does for us what we missed, what we craved. Um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I personally missed going to galleries, you know, I couldn't wait to get down and 
having booked the Artemisia exhibition about three times and having it cancelled and rebooking and cancelled and rebooking and then having to make do with the catalogue <laughs> because, you know, that was the end of it. It was heartbreaking, really. Uh, I think this is a, a good time to open up now to questions and, and perhaps I could start off by taking up Becca's uh, invitation to ask her and Caroline to perhaps reflect on how you kept your staff motivated, particularly at the beginning uh, of, of lockdown. Yeah, I mean, it was quite a, it was, yeah, it was really hard. First of all, of course, uh, the first thing that happens is that uh, not all our staff had laptops. That was the younger generation do a lot just on their phones. I didn't know that until mm, yeah. this happened. Yeah. So there was a lot of getting the right equipment to people. And again, our funders came up from Trump's, thank you, Lloyd's, um, and uh, helped us get sort of laptops that sort of worked um, into houses. So some of it was just really practical. And then, but a lot of it was about, it's quite hard to furlough people. I mean, if your job is front line, like you serve in a cafe or you sell tickets in a box office or you, there isn't actually, what else do you bring to an organization? And yet as an organization, we work very hard to make people feel included. And so that was quite hard. I mean, furloughing and then keeping in touch with people who furloughed and knowing whether they wanted to be kept in touch with and whether you were allowed to keep in touch with them. My God, the law kept changing. That was a nightmare. <laughs> you know, um, that was just, I mean, the financials were just really painful. And actually the unlock, yeah. And, and also that thing of, come on staff, come on back, we really want you. Oh, I'm not sure, I'm not ready. You know, it feels like, no, no, we really want you. Oh, no, it's a lockdown again. Off you go, back you go to furlough. You know, that, that push pull of, you know, of what is, so as a staff member, it's like, what is my relationship to work? I think becomes quite a big question. You know, not as horrific as the artist one, but still a, a quite a identity challenging one. Mm. Our, our experience was <clears throat> probably very atypical. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, my first, my first thought, my first reaction when the, the kind of reality penetrated was what on earth good are we in a global health emergency? Mm. But in, in the way that the, the crisis laid bare so many mechanisms, it made it abundantly manifest what we as a charity were for, which was investing in artists. It was getting cash to the grassroots, to the individuals, um, to, you know, and it's always been a question not only of the money, but of the professional encouragement, the platform for them, the visibility, etc. And so it became very clear to me very quickly that we just needed to do a hell of a lot more of that. Um, and that we needed to do it in a really substantial way um, so that it wasn't a sort of performative act uh, with a little bit of money, but it was a serious amount of money that would actually give an artist a bit of stability. So we were making purchases that were between 15 and 20,000 pounds a pop, um, which is hopefully money that means you have got a few months rent mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of security and stability. So, you know, we supported 40 something artists in this way. So unusually my organization, and we're only 16 of us, mm -hmm. we furloughed two members of staff because we're not generally public facing or our direct public facing is really towards our, our benefactors and patrons, and we couldn't run in-person program. So most of us were working harder than ever. Um, we couriered everyone's um, computers from the office to them at home so they could work. Um, and if we weren't flat out making the money, we were flat out spending it. And then we were, you know, unbelievably busy keeping in contact with all of our people. Um, I think I did 17 online artist studio visits, you know, with 100 people attending each time. Um, it, you know, we were, my colleagues, you know, in the curatorial team, we were just arranging Zooms with museum colleagues up and down the country just to check in with them and see how they were. Mm. Um, we were astonishingly busy. Mm. Um, but 
I absolutely concur with you that going back to the office, that's been the tricky thing. Yeah, it's much harder. It's easy to lock down. <laughs> you just close the doors and you leave the building. Much harder to open up. I think it's about assessment of risk. Yeah, yeah. And the, the way to manage risk, you feel safe if you just lock down everything. Mm -hmm. It's the progressive coming back and to, to what degree do you come back? Mm. that challenges your assessment of risk and mm. um, all the anxieties around it. Yeah. I think it's um, it's incredibly hard. Yeah. I think, Judith, you've got some questions coming in. Um, well, there's quite a lot of people, um, as I said, talking about um, the appetite mm. for making a connection and, and processing what was a big communal um, experience, but also someone's rightly said escapism was mm. also what we craved, wasn't it? Um, and, and these are comments rather than questions, but 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 also saying that actually the upside of the, this kind of steep learning curve virtually was that people did start to go to uh, galleries online. And th is that is that becoming a thing? Is that something that will continue more or not? Um, I, I, my whole life is dedicated to getting human beings in front of real, actual yeah, art in yeah, person. Yeah. For me, it's a physical experience. You stand in front of a painting and you measure yourself against it. And the artist knew how big you as a human being would be, being would be and when they decided how big to make the work. It's about that it, direct live experience. Having said which, I would say that many, many museums around the country would say they made a decade's progress in their digital offer in a couple of months, partly because staff weren't doing other things and they could literally repurpose or you know, redirect colleagues to just get on. I mean, Leeds Art Gallery was doing sculpture from the sofa. Literally, they were doing online Zoom uh, activity with, with, showing, you know, with courses on how to make sculpture literally wow. sitting on your sofa. That's Amazing, good. again, connecting finding ways to connect. So I'm absolutely not knocking the online experience. It's phenomenal. And, and thank God we had it. Yeah. I think in where the meantime, we would have been without. Yes. The online comedy experience wasn't so good, I have to say, <laughs> as a performer and, I, a, I think, and a um, consumer. That thing about the, the, the huge event in digital, one of the things that we did find in that wobbly, are we open, are we not open, was digital was like a security blanket. Mm -hmm. The fact that you could do a 3D version of your gallery you know so that it was like entering a tour meant that the artists had reassurance that if they because we started putting work up as soon as we could back in on in on exhibition and it meant the artists could be reassured that there would this work would be shown in some form um if they're going to spend you know 48 hours in there with the paintbrush and getting it up and yeah. all that then then um then it was going to be shown in some form and and I, I agree with that thing about getting artists' work out there and shown and communicated, you know, is really important. Yeah. Right. Is there anyone in the room who's keen? Yes. Um, is your name Judith? Yes. Yes. Um, you said that you thought there might be works in the pipeline about the pandemic. Yeah. Last thing, I don't want to read them. I just want to move on. Do you? Yes. And I don't know whether my feeling is average or... A lot of people might want to sort of go there and you know read about the what so empathize with how other people felt during the pandemic. I don't know. Um, but related to that, when you said escapism, I think some people said on the were, yes, the online yeah, people, yeah. yeah. Um I'd be very interested in a project for someone, how people's reading changed during lockdown. Because for me, I found I wasn't very good at concentrating. Mm. Mm, and that's so true. I became addicted to Barbara Pym, who I think is very funny, actually, and very good. But I read several of her books three times, you know, um, whereas I actually wasn't really drawn to reading Dostoevsky. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, I'd just be interested to know whether other people felt the, um, had the same experience. I, I became really good at Audible, and, and actually, I think I will remain that way because, like you, I flitted. I, my, my, my concentration really went, but with Audible, I somehow managed to kind of do other things at the same time, and, and actually, my readings increased. But I think that's definitely as a result of lockdown. Um, isn't that interesting? I, I think your statement about I just want to move on is, is definitely true. 
true as well. So that what I mean is that some audiences, you know, comedy is selling well, you know, sort of dark stories about who am I is not selling well, <laughs> you know. So, so um, I think there's something about people wanting that lift rather than kind of internal retrospection. Mm. It's, it's definitely a drive for some people. So I, just need to... I kind of long to see almost like the Samuel Peace <coughs> kind of version, you know, in the sense that he wrote about the fire of London. I, want, I kind of want that big fat volume which looks at that looks at COVID eventually, maybe not now, but eventually that's what I want. Someone in the corner there. Thank you. It's very fascinating. I'm very pleased to see that when I'm focused on education assessment. So I was wondering if it's possible for you to reflect a little bit upon the experiences you've had and moving forward when you know that certain groups have found particularly challenges uh, because art has not been available for them. And we know that, for instance, just how many laptops you have at home differ quite a lot. So there's a lot of young children, teenagers who didn't have anyone who could help them or didn't have anyone to read for them at home and certainly didn't have any tools to do anything in art either. And I'm just curious if you can reflect upon your experiences and what you're doing for the future and perhaps things you've done with that group in mind. Yeah, if I can paraphrase that for the benefit of the microphone and people listening on the internet who may not have picked up all of that. The questions about looking from an educational perspective for those people, particularly young people who didn't have access to IT, were isolated and couldn't look at some of the things that you were talking about, is how moving forward into the future we can try and make that access available. I could, I could just say quick bit about not about our activities but about there's another marvelous uh, art center called arc tea based in cowley um who as well as becoming a food hub and actively delivering food to spaces they were all also actively delivering art materials oh, wow. and so they that one of their big things was they, they they are in contact with a lot of families in need and they were so they kind of had community connections that they already knew and that they were doing, spent a lot of time getting that art out so that people can make it home. And the, there was a citywide thing around the Christmas Light Festival um, last year. I can't, time has elipsed, but um, the, that, that was again about getting the art materials into homes. If we couldn't gather together in the center, can we create things at home and make displays on our streets? Streets became a really interesting thing. Um, posters in windows, drawings yeah, in windows yeah, became a huge thing, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's almost, I'd almost forgotten that. It's funny, yeah, isn't it? Time yeah, has played yeah. tricks on us. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm afraid, you know, my organisation is not, um, is not directly audience facing. Um, so we didn't have that direct experience, although we were intensely conscious of the issue of digital poverty. And I've got friends who teach. Uh, I live in the East End of London, where it's very broad spectrum demographically and you know hearing stories I mean we all take wi-fi in our homes for granted but you know hearing stories of a family with three children with no wi-fi running on a on a uh, um, yeah and three children trying you know taking it in turns to do their homework on on their mom's phone in an evening I mean this is this is digital poverty writ large it's very mm very serious and it was very salutary to hear those stories because you just don't think and obviously in normal times they could go to the library and get the wi-fi or they'd go somewhere to mcdonald's and get yeah. the free wi-fi suddenly that wasn't available um, in terms of um, responses that i've heard from from some of our museum members i know that some of them were, were running incredible programs for children sending out hundreds and hundreds of art mm. activity packs the town are in Eastbourne, I know, are very, very active doing that sort of thing. And I know that, um, for example, Manchester Art Gallery um, was early on very aware of the issue of digital poverty and interestingly switched to activity on the radio as a way of reaching people in a more affordable, more democratic 
way. Activity on, how do you mean activity on radio? I'm not entirely certain <laughs> because I, you know, it's not my program, but I know that when I had a conversation with the director, he said, yeah, we're turning towards doing things on local radio. Oh, on local radio, oh, right. Mm. I mean, I, I, I'm quite struck by that question about how much the pandemic did actually polarise the, the gap between particularly young people who had access to IT and those, those young people who had restricted access uh, to IT. And I suppose a question buzzing at the back of my mind will be whenever this public inquiry takes place, is whatever happened to the promise to get all children a laptop? Because it seems to me part, part of answering that for the future is thinking about hybrid teaching and hybrid relationships we're talking about the hybrid workspace, but I was quite struck yesterday by an item on the local news talking about hybrid teaching and getting teaching in a manner that suited individual children a lot more than just thinking about classroom learning or presenting in a particular way. And, and I think you're highlighting a real issue that needs following up for the future. And, and I hope that either by collaboration with individual arts groups and schools or or, or more formally, it, it is a question that, that can be resolved, although I suspect it won't be an easy one uh, to resolve. Uh, yes, Brigitte. I find myself looking for other people in the same position of still overcoming my fear of being in places. For instance, I tried the Pizarro exhibition and it last more than five minutes because there were so many people that I would go back when there are fewer people. I was in Peterborough two months ago with girlfriends. And they could not drag me out of the gallery there. It was just a regional gallery, but there were no people, and I didn't care what I saw. I engaged every single item that I wouldn't have done before the pandemic. Mm. And in a month's time, I'll try and roll up the house for the first time, a place where I used to be four times a month. And I'm scared. I'm going back on the 2nd of April. I'm scared of people in that confined space, in spite of fully vaccinated, having had COVID, wearing the mask, taking all the precautions. So I think there's also the element of an officious meal, just a little bit of fear still of all human beings. <laughs> Uh, again, for the benefit of, of the microphone, if I can just say there was a, an interesting comment from the floor there about uh, fear hasn't been about just going back to the workplace, but it's about audiences getting back into auditoriums and starting to mix in the gaining crowds. And I wonder, oh, yeah. uh, perhaps, Becca, this is one for you oh, yes. to comment this is on. Definitely one for me, in that, you know, we had a new play by Mike Bartlett in Oxford and we didn't sell out. This is just extraordinary. This is completely extraordinary circumstances. And it is because there is a push-pull. There are those people who are ready to come out and those who aren't. It's an incredible challenge for arts organizations because there's virtually no money in theater anyway, unless you're the West End, there really isn't. And you need every single seat filled. But at the same time, you want to welcome your audience safely and comfortably. So we, we stuck with for much longer than the rules we've always done everything for longer than the rules told us to so we stuck with socially distanced for kind of quite a long time uh, after that rule changed but um it's really hard because you you don't know until you walk into space whether you're going to meet people or not meet people and that's really hard um our exhibition space on a tuesday do come we've got a lovely exhibition at the moment um, and um, it, that I promise you there won't be anybody else there. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to check in on the internet to see if there are any comments, and then I'm going to come to this lady over here. Um, yeah, someone has said, what can we do to encourage new artists to continue? But also, in so far as there were positive things that came out of the pandemic, how can we make sure that we don't drift back to the way things were before? Um, and in particular, where some people were felt, felt, felt excluded from the arts. But I suppose, how can, we, how can we make sure that we build on some of the things that we learned from COVID? I mean, I think the other, in, in my world, um, the other issue that, that runs, has run concurrently and become even more urgent is that of the climate crisis through the last few years. And so um, there's a, an organisation that has arisen called the Gallery Climate Coalition um, and it's, uh, it includes commercial galleries as well as museums and other arts professionals 
um, looking at, well, running a carbon audit on their organization, looking hard at the way that they operate and how they can reduce their carbon footprint. And the, the contemporary art world is, we used to be fanatical about traveling the entire time. I mean, flights you know, across the world constantly because one didn't wish to appear parochial, one needed to be internationally connected and doing so much in person. Um, that I think has changed. I think people are a lot more conscious. I think <clears throat> I've spoken to a lot of commercial galleries who said, you know, I used to, I used to f fly to Los Angeles for a day to see a collector, one day in Los Angeles, fly back again. They've been doing everything on Zoom for two years. Yes, they realize actually it's that, quite it? nice to yeah. know what your children look like and they yeah. could just do it on Zoom and yeah. they had the same, you know. So, and I think a lot has moved online. There was, um, there was uh, already movement towards people buying online and the old school among us were really rather sniffy about that. And would anybody ever spend a million pounds on a work of art online? Well, they sure do now. Gosh, yes, they do, because the wealthy became wealthier during the pandemic, mm. it's a fact, and stuck at home, they were worried about what was on the walls, and they wanted to buy art, and they did. Did they? More <laughs> than before, Yeah, obviously. So mm. I think that remains, that re change remains, but in terms of positives coming out of it, I think the, the art world is still going to go back to travelling, there's the Venice Biennale this summer, there's documenta, there's the Berlin Biennial, I mean, there's just so much happening. Um, but I think we will be, people will be more circumspect about their carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. We have to be, we just have to. I think a lady here. There's a bit of a follow on actually from what's just been said. I'm hearing an awful lot of positive things actually. I just think people generally you know very grassroots have really got in touch with their creativity that they didn't know how you know that wonderful one that telephones out of the windows and community projects but people that perhaps wouldn't have tapped into that creative side of them absolutely have and i'm wondering whether the two of you administratively you know with all the nightmares that you had have actually had to think in a much more creative way and come up to the challenge and whether that sort of thing will continue uh, again, for, for the benefit of people online, I think a, a very interesting comment about how the pandemic has allowed people to tap into their own personal creativity. I think it was described as a grassroots level. And just wondering whether this would be reflected in organisations. Uh, um, we're, we're, we're definitely changing our practice. So we are um, providing much more opportunities for individual creativity. So before you could come and you could see art and theatre and dance and whatever. Actually, dancers had a really rough time. That, that, that's another conversation. But um, but going forward, we're very much looking at in what ways can we make people feel creative in our building, and what can they do, and what are the activities on offer, and and have a much wider range of ways in which people can lightly be creative or in depth be creative and in what ways people can start to feel the artistic within them so even if you don't label think of yourself as an artist in what ways you can that's that's a big part of how we're changing what we do in terms of the offer to the public but that's in plan and involves fundraising mm -hmm. i think I have time for one last question if anyone is dying to ask anything or whether there's any comment from online judith um, I think it's, uh, oh, oh, well, somebody who just says there's been a recent trend towards NFT sales, given the ne negative impact on the climate of Bitcoin mining. Do you see this trend subsiding? Well, I don't think I even understand that question. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand that, Caroline? I do. Oh, I, right. do. Okay. So I think it was responding it. to what you were saying. Yes. Um, it's... Is it a bit niche? So um, an, an NFT is uh, it's the acronym that stands for a non-fungible token. It means it's a, it's a digital asset. It has been described as a Bitcoin with a picture on it. Right. Um, and these can be traded. Generally, they're traded in cryptocurrencies. And you buy one. I mean, there was um, famously... Uh, year before last, one was sold at Christie's for 
several multiple millions of pounds. Yes. I would argue that the art world, the visual arts are a space for, in, for experimentation and innovation. And that's interesting that this sits within a visual art space. Um, there have been other uses of NFTs. One was minted last week uh, that was an image of the Ukrainian flag and it sold for $6.5 million one day last week, which was wow. money going for, for the people of, the, of Ukraine. So it can be used in very, very interesting mm. ways. Um, yeah. I'm not going I could, I could, <laughs> to. I could go on, but I'm not going to. Well, anyone who finds a non-fungible token in their pocket worth <laughs> $6.5 million are doing better than I am at the moment. Uh, I think it just remains for me to do some thank yous uh, now. So um, I'd like you all to perhaps join with me in thanking our panel, uh, Caroline Douglas, Becca Valens, and Judith Holder stepping in for a very interesting and informative discussion this evening. Uh, it would also be remiss of me if I didn't thank Kellogg College for hosting this event and particularly the event staff who've worked very hard to pull this together and organise the IT. So thank, thank you, you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. And finally, thank you for attending, whether you're here in person in the hub at Kellogg or whether you're online making some very interesting comments because the event would have been nothing without you. So thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.